this meeting can be recorded. Okay, so everybody knows we're being recorded. So welcome to RISE. This is Rod Perry doing Securing Against Space Weather, or what is space weather? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a bigger question. All right, so uh, do you want me just to flip the slides for you? Yeah, do you mind? Yep, I don't mind at all. And of course, I made the, the tragic newbie presenter mistake of reorganizing the slide deck this afternoon because I, I didn't like the flow and then I realized, oh, now I'm not going to know what's what. So if you see the surprise look on my face as each slide comes up, I actually gave this presentation to our emergency management team. We call it the incident command team at Corellian. And I, I thought it was interesting enough that maybe the security folks would enjoy this. I know a lot of my uh, presentations are not always on strict security topics, but I hope you find them interesting and maybe get something out of it. All right, let's, let's pop to the next one. Can everybody oh, hear? Yeah. Can yeah. everybody hear, hear Rob? Now? <laughs> yeah. Very good. All right. So here we go. All right. Next, next slide. Really. Here we go. All right. I, I'm wearing a mask. I don't care if you wear a mask. This is my little thing. So do whatever you want. I'm a Moderna man, vaccinated. But uh, anyway, I just didn't want anyone to feel stressed out about me wearing a mask. And let's hope we don't have to wear a mask soon for any of us. But anyway, moving on. All right, so standard disclaimer, everything you're going to hear is from me, not from my official. <laughs> uh, this is not anything that reflects on Corellian or their beliefs and strategies, positions, et cetera. This is all my, my take, my opinion. All right, so what are we going to cover? So I want to first talk about, uh, reintroduce you all to our son, and then define a few definitions of some things around space weather, then talk about some history around space weather, discuss why I think we need to take space weather seriously in the next few years, and then finally some steps you can take to protect against maybe some worst case scenarios with space weather. All right, so we all think of the sun as this beautiful majestic thing in the sky, the beautiful sunset, but I'm here to tell you that the sun is anything but a, a solid globe of just beauty. This is a raging nuclear furnace. This thing is turning 4 million tons of matter into energy every second through this massive nuclear explosion. The sun is not stable. The sun, in fact, is very periodic. It goes through a solar ebb and flow. Every 11 to 15 years, it goes through the sunspot cycle. And we now are starting sunspot cycle 25. So as long as they've been recording these sunspot cycles, and People started taking notes back in the early 1900s of how many sunspots are there, and that's how they measure the intensity, is uh, how many sunspots are occurring. And when these sunspots increase, so do things called coronal mass ejections and other things. So we're heading into sunspot cycle or solar cycle 25, and I want to tell you why that's important to us, to all of us. because power points won't forward during the sunspot cycle 25. <laughs> All right, so what does uh, increased solar activity mean? So it, it, it's these sunspots that appear on the sun, and these things are massive. I, I, if you look in that picture, the, the top right, the, these things are Earth-like in size, and they're where these magnetic disturbances occur on the surface of the sun, and the sun begins emitting stuff called solar flares from these, uh, from these uh, sunspots. And then worse, because magnetism is involved, things like called a coronal mass ejection spew out from the sun. And if you look at this bottom right picture, note that little circle in the corner. That's the size of Earth. So these things are belching out from the sun, and they are massive in size, you know, huge. So uh, that's what has uh, me concerned most, and I'm hoping I convince you to be concerned about them as well. Moving on. So here's my analogy. I tried to come up with an analogy. This increased solar activity is like when you're cooking bacon and you turn the heat up too hot. You end up with cooler spots on the skillet where maybe water's building up, and then you get these increased little steam coming off, and that's the solar flares that are coming off. And then finally, the grease like burns you. It, it spits off from the pan. That's the coronal mass ejection. And then that's what I'm going to tell you. A little, we're going to probably focus on that a little more. Move it. So with all this badness coming at us all the time, what's protecting us? And the answer is the Earth's magnetosphere. It's a giant magnetic protection 
And these are animations from NASA on the right, where Earth, there's Earth there in the center. You can see this magnetic field that's out there, and we're constantly getting slammed by the sun, and this magnetic sphere is trying to protect us. It absorbs and deflects much of this crud that's coming from the sun, but it fluctuates in its strength and its, its capabilities. And uh, without uh, this magnetosphere, we would turn into a Mars very quickly. The, the solar wind, this million mile an hour solar wind would just wash our atmosphere away rather quickly. So good on the magnetosphere, but there are concerns with it. We'll touch on that. Moving on. So we talked about it. So why should we care about it? And as I've kind of, this is a little bit of a recover, but we're heading into solar cycle 25. And here's one prediction. And this is kind of the mainstream prediction on the intensity of solar cycle 25. There in the left corner, you see the, the graphs. Uh, if solar cycle 25 is very modest, then we probably don't have a huge amount to worry about. But maybe I'm going to I'm going to caveat that. But you can see that there have been previous solar cycles that were rather powerful, and in fact there were some in the 1800s that were incredibly powerful. That if they happen today, well, I'll talk more on that later. Let's keep moving. You're scaring me, Rob. Well, you know, come on, fear, uncertainty, doubt. I'm a see so. <laughs> I, live off, I live off the bus. So I'm sure some of you have seen the movies about EMPs, right? This is not an EMP, so I don't want you to think we're not talking about that, the nuclear blast or the thing that, that is that high intensity, brief duration that fries electronics. You don't even have to have them plugged in. This is not what we're talking about. CMEs are a different thing, so uh, I don't want to discuss EMPs. You guys can see enough of the fear stuff out there, but EMPs require typically a nuclear event to occur. This isn't anything that's going to occur naturally, to, to my knowledge. So. I'm going to focus more on what space weather can do and how it can impact us. All right, next. So, a little history on space weather. So, this guy named Richard Carrington, a British astronomer, he was just obsessed with these sunspots. That drawing there in the top corner, that was him drawing the sunspots on the sun back on August 28, 1859. He takes up, he would open a window, have the sun hit, hit some. Uh, a, a glass that focused it a little bit onto the wall. And you sit there and draw them. And he's doing this one day, and all of a sudden, whew, it all just turns bright white. So what happened? Where did they go? They all disappeared for like a minute. What happened? Well, what happened was the largest CME that we know about. This is a coronal mass ejection. That spitting of the of the sun's plasma came out, sparked out of this these sunspots and we're heading directly towards Earth. And what was the impact? Well, about a day and a half later, that stuff hits the Earth's magnetosphere, and the magnetosphere tries to push back, but it can't hold it back. And this energy just comes down onto the Earth. Now, people, animals, plants, we're not affected by this. This is just like, imagine this energy coming down, not, not like an EMP, super high power energy, just this low power energy blanketing the Earth. And what was technology back in 1859? Telegraph machines was about all we had. Well, those telegraph wires, they started arcing electricity. The guys on the teletypes are getting shocked. One office catches fire, telegraph lines are catching on fire. That was the extent of the impact of the technology back in 1859. Oh, auroras, you guys know the aurora borealis, those beautiful lights. You could see them in the Bahamas. Like, so at nighttime in England, when they went to bed, people were waking up and thinking, oh, it's, it's time to get up because it's so bright outside from the aurora. So anyway, the, the good news for everybody back in 1859 was minimal disruption except for the four telegraph operators. <laughs> yeah. But just imagine what it had, would be like if that happened today. All right. Next history weather. 1989. We're moving a little forward now. So it was a medium sunspot cycle. I don't have a picture of it. But a CME the size of 36 Earths came out from the sun. That's not Carrington level, but it's pretty big. And it was headed, it kind of deflected at an angle to hit Canada, the northern half of the earth. Well, the Quebec uh, power grid got, got knocked off for nine hours, six million people without power. That picture on the top right is one of the transformers 
that got impacted. You can see how big they are because of the size of the dude. And then that's what happened to it bottom right. It just got burned up from, and, and here's the best way I can explain this. These power transformers, if anyone familiar, these are the things you see every now and then on the side of the road, especially if you, like where you see the power lines coming over the mountain, and then they go to these transformers that step that amazing amount of power down so that we can use it. So they, they transfer it at amazingly high voltages and then step it down. Well, what happens is you guys have done the old balloon on the hair thing where you think of it like a worldwide level of that electricity just running across the earth, just coming down the earth. And these electric wires, these power lines just keep getting energized and energized and this energy is coming down from the earth. This coronal mass ejection is just, and then this energy just is bolting down through the wires and it just overwhelms these, uh, it overwhelms these transformers. So, yeah, and then and of course auroras were seen as far as south as Texas. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it was, it was pretty serious, but not, not all. That was cycle, solar cycle 22. So then fast forward to 2012, this is cycle 24, the one just previous to the one we're heading into. The sun blasts out a, a Carrington level explosion. But you know what? We're faced the other way. So first is is up here, and this is coming out this way. So we were very lucky. Had it had it been winter time, had the Earth been over here, might not have been a good situation. So we were fortunate in 2012 that during the peak of cycle 24, boom, out came one of these CMEs, but it wasn't aimed at Earth. And uh, I'm going to tell you. Lloyd's of uh, Lloyd Churin did an analysis of this, and we'll talk about what could have happened or what their opinion was had this been taken down. All right, this is my bonus event. This just happened, like, and I don't know if this is I don't know what to make of this, other than it kind of ties in some earlier stuff. I probably put this a little forward in the slide deck, but on the August first or second of this month, that. That chart at the top is in uh, GMT or UTC, so the timings don't match the tweet. There was a very minor CME that came out, and when I saw it, I was like, okay, we're not going to, nothing to worry about here. A couple of them, like a little spit out. And so, uh, but when it hit the earth, we, back on this, like the second, it was far worse than it should have been. And I don't know, I, I called to find out if they determined what the root cause was. E911 here in Roanoke went offline for hours. They had an electrical fire in their uh, their processing center. Now that coal, you know, coalition does not equal causation, right? I'm waiting to find out what the root cause is, but they got zapped from a, and from a very minor CME, well not minor, but you know, yeah, I'd say a minor CME. So we need, we need to pay attention to that. I think it's worth all paying attention. Yes, sir. What's the monitoring system using the upper right? So I'll talk about that. That's NASA's uh, NO, uh, no, no, National NOAA, who are they? No. 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 Uh, yeah. That's their system for monitoring how much of the space weather is affecting our atmosphere. Not sure what it is, but it's something called the KP index. And it's actually my favorite one to watch. Watch the KP index. I'll talk about it later. I think I, I put that in there. Definitely a slot. It's a, you can, if you Google KP index, you can see where we are. For the last uh, last three to four days, so, but we watch KP index every day. Radio operators. Yes, because you guys are August first or second knocked out almost every amateur radio band for it, 48 hours. Right, we couldn't communicate the inside. And and it really shouldn't have for the amount of energy that the sun came out. No, that, it was enough to knock out the band. Yes, yeah, so we, we didn't absolutely call it, we called it a solar flare. Yeah, we didn't call it a CP. Okay, all right, but. Anyway, yeah, good. Uh, so just, there, there you go. It's a real world. I, I like the fact that you mentioned that because that just happened. Yeah, and, and that's why I was trying just to get in there. That. Yeah, but but this isn't the one I'm worried about. Yeah, okay, good. So uh, I mentioned. So here's what uh, Lloyd's Insurance came out with. You can Google this. It's freely available. They wanted to analyze what would happen if a Carrington level, like that 1859 event, if one of those happened in an extreme geomagnetic storm. Hit. And their, their opinion is they should occur every 150 years, within 162 years happened the last. Uh, and he said the risk of, of an intense geomagnetic storm is at its peak, at, at the top of the uh, solar cycle. 
And so solar cycle 25, the one we're just heading into, it peaks at 2025, 2027, and maybe closer to 2024 to 2026. So we're heading into the peak. And by the way, if you look at this, at the, how they're mapping it, it's a much earlier rise. What we've seen is a much earlier rise than the, the usual. Doesn't necessarily mean that's a, that doesn't mean it's a trend. So their opinion was that the total population at risk of one of these Carrington level events happening to the United States would be 20 to 40 million people without power for 16 days to one to two years. Think about one to two years of no power, folks. All right. I have some good news on that for us, Rowan Oakers, by the way. Some really good news. So you might ask, one to two years to recover. Why? Why does this take so long? See this, this larger picture in the center? If you look in the bottom right corner, you can see a truck. It gives you a sense of the size of these things. These transformers are massive and they're heavy as crap. They're full of oil and they are purpose built, meaning that or they're, they're built to order. So there's not like there's dozens and hundreds of these sitting around. They're expensive, they need to be ordered, and they're the things that blew up. I, I included it again from the Quebec picture. These are the ones that blow up when there's a, a, a large geomagnetic storm. So that's why it could take up to two years, because if a bunch of these blow up, we got big problems in the country. All right. Here's the good news. See these? Can you make out where we are, Rona? And this this darker blue what color would you say that is? I'm not afraid of color. This bluish line here where we are, I highlighted it. For some great reason, we are on the latest and greatest power technology here in Roma. We're on this 765 volt network. And the good news about that is the engineers who built that thought about this. So there's been thought put into how would we deal with a CME, one of these power events. And so we would definitely be impacted. But the good news is we're probably going to be far less impacted than all these other places that have the older technology, the 345, the 500. And I think I talk about this later, but I want you to think about what would it mean if we're back, we got power back, but they're not back for two years or a year. What's that going to look like? What's that going to look like to Roanoke? <laughs> Millions of people without power. Roanoke's got power. <laughs> <laughs> maybe make the time to rent out that room what's that place what can you do with the airbnb, airbnb. airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> if the internet's up i don't know <laughs> okay moving on um yeah actually i just did one of my papers in my security class on um america's infrastructure and it was on the satellite systems and power grid yes and it would actually solar solar cycles and stuff is I'm really interested in also. Um, so besides just from a security standpoint, if you know another country hacked our grid, how yeah. bad it would be, but just the, the infrastructure and the stuff that I learned about, you know, how it's built and how the bones of the infrastructure is so old. It is it's terrible. just gonna be devastating to a lot of people. So. Yeah, right. I, that's why I was very encouraged and frankly thrilled to see that Roanoke had this upgrade. I think it was circa 2016, 2017 that we had that done here. So wonderful, but um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be, yeah. it, it, should one of these hit? <laughs> ah, there. So the question is then, what is cycle 25 going to be like intensity wise? The, the, most people are thinking that it's going to be a fair to moderate level sunspot cycle. As a matter of fact, we're heading towards something called grand solar minimum, where we're supposed to have a whole sunspot cycle where nothing happens. The, the sun goes completely dormant, and a lot of people are hoping that's what 25 is going to be a lead in. However, just because I love to bring that flood to you all, that fear uncertainty doubt, University of Maryland researchers announced this new way of predicting uh, sunspot cycles called hysteria. <laughs> called the termination event, which, you know, just has such a negative connotation to it. But it has to do with when these, uh, these are um, uh, positive negatives, right, where they cancel each other out. 
And if you see, there's a time frame running here. And they figured out there's a timing to these suns when these things cancel each other out. That can tell you, and they backtrack the data going back the last five or six sunspot cycles. And they feel very confident that this sunspot cycle, we, we deduced that sunspot cycle 25 could have a magnitude, of an intensity that rivals the top few since records began. So this one might be a big one, folks. That's, yeah, why, that's why I'm bringing it to you. Yeah, 23 and 24 uh, both had mm -hmm. lower sunspot levels, and that brought on the theory that we were going back to another minimum. Yep. But the other uh, body of theories is that meant that this was a buildup for a big cycle 25. So the <laughs> it's it, it split 50-50 it is whether it's training down or that's it's exactly. training up for another big one. That's exactly There is no consensus on, on my side of the fence. I'm saying it's going to be a big one. I think it's going to be a big one. I, I'm kind of certain. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, during, during a skin with that radiation yeah. and the mm -hmm. nurse rotating, yes. will it affect everyone across the world or just is it will it move fast enough that it's only going to affect where it's, it's a great question, and I, I've read competing theories on how bad it would be. But one example, that, the one example someone said is: imagine the Earth side that's facing the sun is getting the worst of it, and the magnetosphere is being pulled like it's being hit, and it's like a rubber band that's being pulled back. And then when the intensity stops, that, that rubber band snaps back, and the other side gets hit. So there may be no escape, or it might be like a double hit. You're hit here, you turn, and then the other side smacks. You know, we don't know enough. It hasn't happened often enough for us to have a lot of good data, but it's an excellent question. All right. I don't know that I want to hit the next one. Yeah. Everybody, <laughs> everybody, drink up. It only gets better. Bug out. Back. You're not allowed to do any more presentations. <laughs> next will be why the uh, COVID is going to mutate into a network. <laughs> Yes, you would. Yes, and a matter of fact, uh, during that August first second event, several airlines had outages. I think uh, Spirit and American, but it's not quite cell, clear. Cell phone companies watch this carefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. This kills cell phone service. Right, the satellite. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. So the question earlier was, how do we monitor this? And and uh, uh, and NOAA is actually has a great space weather website where you can go and see. Uh, at, a, at a glance, what's the status on on space weather? And you can see like how are the geomagnetic storms? How's the G? We're in green for G. This is not today, but I checked today. We're we're good. So it's similar. Uh, solar radiation, how much is coming in? Radio blackouts, how are they being impacted? So this is one way. Just like you check the weather every day. I think I'm repeating. I'll say this again, but just like you check the weather every day, check this website every day and just make sure. Okay, space weather looks healthy. Good. Right. <laughs> Moving on. How much advanced notice do you get on something like that? Do you see it bubbling up or so what day? when if it's a CME, mm -hmm. you get about depending on the speed, and typically the bigger ones move a little <clears> bit slower. <throat> so you, you'll have 17 to 24 hours. So they're gonna see it. The satellites, we have these satellites that are all positioned around the earth. I forget their names, but I'm sorry, around the sun, and they're watching. So they're going to see it coming, and we'll we'll get notified. So you'll have time, and I will touch on that. So because the, there is preparation, to get. you'll have time to head to the bunker. Yeah. Exactly, you'll have time to determine how to spend your last hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. No, no, Faraday. No, that won't help. That won't. So here's the one that has me concerned. As if the rest is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the one that really has <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the one that has me concerned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, as the other stuff was just, you know, nothing. There seems to be, some, well, at the very least, so that magnetosphere we talked about, that wonderful shield, it's weakening. How much it's weakening and how quickly there's, there seems to be lately, like the last two years, people stop talking about it as much. It was a very big topic in like 2015 ish. And the European Space Agency, they say it's gone down 15%. NASA says 10%. Uh, 
Then they said 9% more recently. They came with a blog post a couple days ago that said 9%. But it's clear that it's accelerating. So it's, it's starting to increase for whatever reason. And the European Space Agency actually launched a bunch of, they call them swarm satellites, that are trying to determine why, are, why is this magnetosphere weakening. And uh, the concern is we've never been through a sunspot cycle with this much weakness. And if you think about what I talked about on the first and second, what happened there, are, are we going to deal with the fact that our magnetosphere can't protect us even from the moderate space weather? Eh, don't know. So, it's, but it's something to be aware of. The magnetosphere is weak. So shields at ninety percent. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know how much longer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how they're determining what it was 150 years ago? Still? Like, where are they getting the Baseline, yeah. I don't know. That's an excellent question. Yeah. And how, who's how to say, they, right? Yeah, nobody's taking samples over there. Yeah. I don't know. That's a really good question. Yep. There, there are um, stuff that they're using. Yeah. I'm sure there's some measurement that they're, like you say, something in a tree bark, something. You know, whatever. All right. So let's talk about what we can do about this. So some of these are kind of common sense, but. Uh, what can you do? Make sure you have surge protectors on all your devices. One of the other things that um, there seems to be controversy on this, but I'll just say it here. Some people think that the weakening magnetic field will also mean more intense thunderstorms or thunder and lightning. So if you should always have surge protectors on the stuff you care about, just because if we're going to see more intense lightning storms, you're going to get hit more often. So make sure you have your important devices surge protected. Consider extended reliance on generator power. What do I mean by that? Thinking about the Roanoke power grid, you should try to have a goal of being able to keep your critical systems up for three weeks on generator. That's a haul. So what that might mean, and for companies like Carillion, we have contracts in place, and we're topping up our generator tanks to make sure they have enough gas or enough diesel fuel. And then from a network connectivity standpoint, consider having diverse products in for your network. So fiber optic and coax, <laughs> cellular as a backup. <clears throat> have have something that can rely on different technologies because if one goes down then you have one. That's a pretty common thing. Next. Next. So I mentioned the uh, the NOAA website. Keep an eye on it. The same you check the weather, check the website, see how space weather doing. As I mentioned earlier, CMEs, they take 17 to 30 hours to impact the Earth. So that's plenty of time to get notified and prepare. Uh, most of the CMEs are not going to be Carrington level events strength, strength. So don't when you hear that there is one, don't assume the worst. But again, the August 2nd event may be an indication that these lesser CMEs are something to be concerned about. Know how to fully disconnect your whatever it is, your house, your business. Know how to disconnect from the grid if something's happening. And by that I mean, if you can do it safely, instead of just flipping a breaker, take out the breaker. Give it, the, give it a gap because if that, if the lines are going to get energized, you do not want that arcing over or, or jumping a breaker into your and then damaging your equipment. Follow the guidance from any government agency. I hope that if it's a big enough event, we're going to get notification about. It. And then be prepared. As I said earlier, be prepared to connect, disconnect from the grid if advised, know how you would do it. And then, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, we're very fortunate to have be a part of the 765 uh, kilovolt power grid, uh, which has better resistance to space weather events. So my guess is local transformers, a few of them would take a hit, the ones where the power's coming over the mountain from, the, but maybe we're not going to be down for years, just weeks. All right. I don't remember if there's much after this. Let's just see. I know. That's it. Bottom line. Get prepared. Don't be afraid. Just be prepared. Mm -hmm. So um, buy lots of surge protectors. Lots of surge protectors. Yes, because again, this isn't like you have to put everything in a galvanized trash can for the EMP event. This is protect against power from the outside. So um, I don't want to I want to make sure that those that are online get an opportunity. So do we have any questions from those that are online that are uh, on from our uh, forum online? 
Make sure you they've all sulked off just crying into the <laughs> everybody everybody's buying out buying search protectors and stuff <laughs> and generators contacting the uh contacting the uh power companies how do i get on a generator exactly any questions yeah for real comments thoughts qualms quizzes i just think that this kind of points out to the fact that from a data resiliency standpoint you know having your data stored in multiple data centers across the globe is extremely important because I mean, you might think that a data center here in Roanoke and then one say in Lynchburg is great, but you could take out both data centers and now your data is gone. Right. If, if we happen to be facing front and center and get the brunt of it. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, but what if the device that you take has got hit too? Mm -hmm. So I've always had that thought too, that we're, as a country and as a world, we'll become more reliant on digital storage. What if something happened so bad that it took out every piece of electronics, we have no documentation for anything, how do we build anything, how to start over? You know, my first job out of uh, school was doing missile launching for uh, the Navy. Well, I was working for a defense contractor, and we used these computers called Yuck Yush, Yuck Yush 44s, and it was all paper tape. I thought, how stupid. And this is like the late 80s. And uh, it was all paper tape. And I was like, why paper tape? And it's for that very reason, because if there's an EMP, you're going to lose all your, you're not going to be able to reload your systems for warfare. And so, yeah, there's something to be said. But I think that was like 4K worth of data of this little tiny school. Oh, so, yeah. I, I, we need to have some kind of protection, like the Faraday cages, perhaps data centers that are Faraday cage protected. Yeah. The business is moving to cloud solutions. How many you know, vendors, AWS, Azure, for Microsoft, things like that, are what are their plans for Space Weather? I wonder. I wonder. You don't hear a lot about it. That's why I try to bring it to you guys to at least. Keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, really not trying to. Uh, well, it's okay because I have O365 and everything's going to be fine because I'm on my OneDrive, right? <laughs> well, it's in the cloud and the clouds are above the ground. <laughs> the electricity <laughs> won't be affecting the cloud. Right, I'm in the cloud. The cloud computers okay, right? are up there. Yeah, that's yeah. not that electric. Your, your, your data might be there, but you might not be able to get there to get to it. <laughs> there there <laughs> could be a problem. Yeah. So, would this impact, like, electric cars or anything like that <laughs> well so as long as the electric car isn't plugged into the grid at the time so it's only the grid that's really going to be affected the grid is the, going to be that's exactly right yeah. the power grid will be energized to levels far beyond it was ever designed to handle and then that energy must go somewhere like you know all electricity must find ground so, so other things are that because I'm thinking like there's energy in your in your, the battery powered cars, there's energy yeah. in the generators, there's yes. energy in all of that. So is that not going to be experiencing the same type of thing? So that's why I wanted to differentiate this from an EMP. This isn't a high amount of energy in a burst coming down to fry. It's like this blanket. Think of it like just rubbing the balloon across the car. It's not going to be that much, but over all power lines for hundreds of miles, that's what energizes it. Yeah, like the cable, you know, cable, it, it's not buried. All those, that's a lot of, yeah. a lot of copper. copper. <laughs> a lot so of that's a good question. If the, if the cables are buried, does that? I don't, I am not a scientist to be able to say, but I would think that the more earth you have between the, the line and that would help. But I don't know, over distances, that energy is coming down and soaking into the earth. Gotta go somewhere. Got to go somewhere. Is there any distinction between AC and DC here, or is it? I'm sorry. Is there any distinction between AC and DC? Like, like sounds like AC is more to the subcoil to the telephone. Again, I'm so sorry that I, I don't have the technical expertise to answer that. Question. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So you're just here just to scare me. <laughs> For, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Doctor Gloom. You know. <laughs> but put it all in Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And quantum computing. It's all my generators just go over here. Maybe. But does anybody else have any questions for Rob? Anything? Hey, at this point, you can even ask him things that aren't related to this. Just <laughs> sure. The floor is open. Cut the recording. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, if uh, if nobody has anything, I appreciate everybody attending. Make sure to attend next next month where we have the CrowdStrike event, and uh, awesome. 
Oh, you, uh, yeah, because you actually were in that. It's that, awesome. That was a great. That was a great presentation. So uh, we'll uh, at that point we'll go ahead and end. And so if we're on site, we have beer to drink. If you're at home, I hope you have beer to drink. And uh, if not, indulge in your favorite beverage or whatever. And uh, we will talk to you guys later. See you next time. Thanks, Thank you, Barry. Thank you.